this is good. I got the angle. Quiet on the set. <laughs> hey guys, welcome back. <laughs> hey guys, welcome back. I'm back with another series. If you missed the first one, it's available on my channel. It was on time series, signals, the 4 you transform, and the wave of the transform. In this new series, I'll be talking about two things. One, principal component analysis, and two, independent component analysis. So principal component analysis, or PCA, is the topic of this video. So I'll give you a little intuition, share some math, and then I'll finish with a concrete example of how you can use PCA to analyze the stock market. So let's get right into it. So the analogy I like to think of for PCA is imagine like a massive rock band with like 20 members in the ensemble and you have you know two drummers several guitarists you have several keyboardists or pianists you have a string section a horn section vocalist percussionist the whole works so you have this 20 person band and you know that's not a big deal that's uh you know that's the kind of band made for huge arenas and stadiums but if a band like this is just getting started, they're going to have a, a hard time fitting in smaller venues like coffee shops and restaurants. So a natural solution to this problem is to just kind of reduce the number of players at specific performances. So instead of like a keyboardist, a pianist, and whatnot, you could just have one person on the keyboard. Instead of having multiple guitars, you could just have one person doing an acoustic guitar. Instead of two drummers and a percussionist, you can have someone banging on the bongos and so on. In a lot of ways, this is basically what PCA does. So this is the big band on the left is before PCA and then you can kind of boil it down uh, to its core elements for the same band to play at the coffee shop. But instead of uh, a band, you can think of a PCA applying to a data set. Instead of musicians or players in the band, you can think of the variables in your data set. And instead of uh, a song or the music, you can think of what your data set is representing. A bit more concretely, principal component analysis, PCA, uh, reduces input dimensionality and redundancy. So we can think of two variables, X and Y. Uh, this could be something like hot dogs, sold and hot dog bun sold, which are directly uh, correlated, but in a lot of ways uh, contain redundant information. So it may be practical to represent this underlying information instead of through two variables, through just one variable. And then that's uh, application of PCA. So we can transform our axes from this X and Y axis to a new set of axes. We'll call them PC1 and PC2. And then if you want to take it a step further, you can just remove PC2 and just operate uh, with one variable. So essentially, we've reduced the dimensionality from uh, two variables, X and Y, to just one, PC1, if we choose to drop PC2. OK, so how does it work? The basic idea, the goal of PCA is to reduce variable redundancy or input variable redundancy by creating a new set of variables where the variance uh, along each subsequent variable is maximized. So in the previous example, we saw pictorially that we changed from a set of two variables, hot dog sold and hot dog bun sold, to a new pair of variables, we call them PC1 and PC2. And essentially, PC1 contained all the relevant information we needed. And the way we got PC1 is basically rotated the axes to be kind of along this linear slope uh, of points defined by the hot dog bun and hot dog sales. What does that translate to mathematically? So we can um, think of this situation. So we have X, which is a matrix of data, uh, where the rows are data records and the columns are variables. We have W, which is a vector of weights. And then we have T, which is a score vector and what I'm going to be calling uh, a principal component. So T is what we're interested in. We have our data X, and we're trying to find uh, a W that is going to create this principal component for us. 
Okay, so here's here's the magic of PCA. Here's the trick to it all. So the goal here is to maximize the variance of t subject to the constraint that the norm squared of w, so w transpose times w, is equal to 1. Okay, and then variance is uh, defined in the usual way. So you take every element, subtract the mean of the variable, you square it, and then you divide by uh, the number of elements minus one, and then you just add this up for every single element in the set of numbers. Um, and so one really important thing when doing PCA is you want to auto scale uh, your data. So basically, what does that mean? For each number in each column of your matrix, uh, you want to subtract the average and divide by the standard deviation. So if we do that, then the mean of the principal component will turn out to be zero, um, which allows us to kind of drop the mean term in the variance here. It turns out that the variance will just be equal to the norm squared of t divided by uh, the number of elements minus one. Okay, so what does that mean? That means we can rewrite this optimization problem. Instead of maximizing the variance, we can just maximize the norm squared of t because the, the vector w that maximizes the norm squared of t is also going to be the same uh, vector w that maximizes the variance of t. Okay, so we can rewrite uh, the optimization problem using our above expression for t. And it turns out this is actually a pretty straightforward optimization problem to solve. Uh, don't be intimidated by the matrices and vectors. We can use a very well-known and common technique in calculus uh, known as the method of Lagrange multipliers, which basically allows us to uh, rewrite an optimization problem with constraints, a constrained optimization problem, as a optimization problem without constraints or an unconstrained optimization problem. If none of that makes sense, that's fine. We just need these relevant expressions here. So we can write out the Lagrangian, which is this L of X uh, term here, for our PCA optimization problem. And then we can have the associated equations. And this is the exciting part here. This first equation, uh, if we rearrange it, is just an eigenvalue problem, which is a standard problem in linear algebra. And then the second equation is just a restatement of our original constraint. So writing it explicitly here, we can solve for the eigenvalue lambda and the vector of weights w using standard eigenvalue approaches. Um, if you're doing this in some programming language, every programming language like R, Python, MATLAB, they're going to have built-in functions that allow you to solve this problem. And then once we have this vector of weights, we have everything we need. We can just multiply that by x and we can get our principal component. And then this naturally extends to uh, multiple components. So this, we started out just looking for a single component, but if you solve the eigenvalue problem you're, and you have n columns in your matrix x and x is square, you're going to end up with n eigenvalues and n corresponding eigenvectors. And then if you kind of sort these eigenvalues and eigenvectors from largest to smallest, you sort from the largest eigenvalue all the way down to the smallest, each corresponding eigenvector uh, w is going to be a set of weights which define a principal component. And the principal components associated with the larger eigenvalues contain more information than components associated with smaller eigenvalues. So you can define some threshold, like in the first slide, where we could have just dropped PC2 because it wasn't giving us much additional information. You can do the same thing and kind of uh, truncate your variables um, after a certain amount of information is captured with your principal components. Okay, so just as a recap, uh, principal component analysis, it reduces input dimensionality and redundancy. Some key points are new variables are created via a linear combination of input variables. So that's kind of 
uh, what we saw in the previous slide where you had a matrix multiplied by a vector of weights. Uh, that's equivalent to a linear combination of your input variables. And then each subsequent new variable contains less information. We kind of saw that uh, once you sorted your eigenvalues from largest to smallest, the principal components associated with the larger eigenvalues contain more information and the principal components corresponding to smaller eigenvalues contain less information. And then there are a lot of applications for PCA relating variables together. So if two variables get kind of clumped together, kind of like hot dog bun sold and hot dog sold, there's some underlying correlation there. Uh, you can use it for clustering where you can transform your space from your original input space to like a new PCA space and then you can do a clustering algorithm like k-means and then you can also do some outlier identification so you can plot all your points in your principal component space and just kind of visually inspect if there are any outliers. All right, so here's a fun example. Uh, I guess at the outset, I'm going to say I'm not a financial advisor. I've never taken a finance class. Uh, so in no way is this a recommendation of how you should invest your money. This is just a fun example of what PCA uh, can do. So here we're, we're going to use PCA to create an S&P 500 index fund. So an index fund is basically a set of investments that are meant to follow or track with a specific market. The example code's on the GitHub, so uh, I'll probably just fly through this. I used the Yahoo Finance module to get real, actual stock data. So this is all real data, this isn't made up. And then I use Pandas and NumPy for all the number crunching. So I write some code to input the ticker names from Wikipedia and then Graham Guthrie had a nice medium post of how you can grab all these S&P 500 names. So I just uh, stole some code from that post and made some edits. Okay, then I pull S&P 500 data for 2020. I drop NANS, get a Pandas data frame of just closed prices as opposed to all the other information that's available. Get a list of names, uh, ticker names of all the companies in the data frame. So we have 253 rows and 499 columns. So here I, I guess the uh, comments aren't updated so I apologize for that. Uh, but here we're initializing PCA with 10 components and then we'll, ex uh, we'll apply PCA to our data set and we'll print the explained variance. So you can see, you know, the first three components, you're already at more than 90% of the explained variance. Uh, if you just sum up the first three elements of that array there. Um, okay, and then we can create an index fund. So there's countless ways you can do this. I just arbitrarily took the weights defining the first three principal components. I summed them together. And then I only included the top 61 weights. We can represent the... Uh, overall portfolio of this index fund with a bar plot. It's a natural way to do it. So the y-axis is the relative weight. You can also think of this as the number of dollars, relative number of dollars you're going to invest in each specific company. And then the x-axis is just the individual ticker names. Okay, and then we can see how our index fund compares to the actual S&P 500 over 2020. And just, you know, visually, approximately, it doesn't do such a bad job. There's some discrepancies um, along the way, but everyone cares about percent return. So if you would have just bought one share of every single stock in the S&P 500 at the beginning of 2020 and then sold those uh, same shares at the beginning of 2021, you would have made 20% return. If you would have instead followed the uh, investing strategy of this particular index fund derived from PCA, you would have made 25%. So that was the video on principal component analysis. I hope that cleared things up. Uh, if you want to learn more about principal component analysis, I have provided a link to my blog post on Medium on the topic. Stay tuned for the next video where I'll be talking about a similar but different technique, independent component analysis. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, share with your friends and family so they too can learn about principal component analysis. Thanks for watching.